Chapter Two, Part Two of the Metamorphosis or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius, translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter Two, Part Two. It happened on a certain day that Birina earnestly desired me to take a small supper with her, and when I very much excused myself, she said she would never forgive me if I refused to come. I went therefore to Fotis to ask her advice, considering her assent as an auspicious omen, who, though she was unwilling that I should depart from her the breadth of a nail, yet she kindly granted me a little respite from our amatory war. But take care, said she, that you return early from supper, for a furious band of the most noble youth of the city disturbs the public peace. Hence you will everywhere see men that have been murdered lying in the middle of the streets, nor can the aid afforded by the prefect of the province, on account of its great distance, defend the city from so great a calamity. But the splendour of your fortune may create snares for you, and your being a foreigner may render you contemptible. Do not disturb yourself, I said, my Fotis, for I shall return early, not only because I prefer my own pleasures to the banquets of others, but also in order that I may remove your fear. Nevertheless, I shall not go unattended, for I shall carry with me the succour of my safety, since I shall have, depending from my side, my accustomed sword. Thus prepared, I betook myself to supper. There I found many guests, and as she was a woman of rank, they consisted of the flower of the city. The banquet was sumptuous, the beds were splendid with ivory, and covered with cloth of gold. The cups were ample, some of which were more precious than others, but all of them were equally beautiful. This was of glass adorned with figures exquisitely wrought. There stood one of crystal, perfectly pure. Here was a cup of bright silver, and there of glittering gold. And in another place stood one of amber, admirably excavated, so as to be fitted for a drinking vessel. In short, whatever might be believed to be impossible to be effected was there. The servants who distributed the food were numerous and magnificently clothed, and the delicacies were abundant. Virgins, elegantly ministrant, attended, and boys with curled locks and beautifully attired, frequently handed to the guests old wine in gems fashioned into cups, and now the lamps being introduced, convivial conversation abounded, together with frequent laughter, liberal jests and pleasant jibes. Then Birina thus addressed me, Do you find yourself comfortable in our country? For I know that we excel all other cities in temples and baths and other public works. We likewise abound with provisions. Certainly we have here tranquil liberty, and the stranger who is intent on business may here find a multitude of men resembling those of Rome. But the unambitious stranger will find here rural quiet. Lastly, the whole province comes to this place for the sake of solitary pleasure. To this I replied, What you say is true, nor have I thought myself to be anywhere more free than I am here. But I am very much afraid of the dark and inevitable retreats of the magic discipline, for it is said that not even the sepulchres of the dead are secure, but that certain relics and fragments of dead bodies are snatched from the burning pyres, for the purpose of being subservient to the destruction of the living. And old witches, at the very moment of the preparation for a funeral, outstrip by the rapidity of their speed the burial of strangers. In addition to what I thus said, another person observed, Here indeed they do not even spare any of the living, and one whom I know, having suffered something of this kind, was mutilated in his face, which was everywhere deformed. In the meantime, unrestrained laughter diffused itself through the whole banquet, and the eyes of all the guests were turned towards a certain person who sat in a corner apart from the rest of the company. This man, being confused by the pervicaciousness of all those who were looking at him, and indignantly muttering to himself, was preparing to rise and go away, 
But Birina said to him, Do not go, my telephron, but stop a little while, and with your usual urbanity resume your narration from the beginning, that this my son Lucius also may partake of the pleasure produced by your facetious tale. To this he said, you indeed, madam, always preserve an inviolable probity, but the insolence of certain persons is not to be borne. Thus he, being moved with indignation. The urgent entreaties, however, of Birina, who conjured him by her own life to give the narration, forced him at length to comply. Telephron, therefore, having made a pile of the coverlets, leaning on his elbow and raising himself a little on the bed, extended his right hand and composed the articulation of his fingers after the manner of orators having likewise shut the two lowest fingers he expanded the rest in a prominent position and gently smiling with his thumb stretched out began as follows while i was yet a pupil i went to miletus to see the olympic games and as I wished also to visit these places of this famous province, having travelled all over Thessaly, I came with ill omens to Larissa, and while roving through every place, the money which I had brought with me for my journey being very much diminished, I was exploring some means of mitigating my poverty, I beheld in the middle of the forum a certain tall old man. He stood on a stone, and proclaimed with a loud voice, If any one wishes to be the guardian of the dead body of one deceased, he shall be well rewarded for the undertaking. Then I said to one that was passing by, What is the meaning of this proclamation? Are the dead in this place accustomed to run away? He answered, Be silent, for you are very young and perfectly a stranger, and you are also ignorant that you are in the middle of Thessaly, where witches everywhere lacerate with their teeth the faces of the dead, and such conduct is to them the solace of the magic art. To this I replied, Tell me, I beseech you, in what does this funeral guardianship consist? In the first place, said he, you must incessantly watch through the whole night with open and unwinking eyes continually fixed on the dead body nor must your sight ever be diverted from this object nor in the smallest degree turned from it for these worst of witches having transformed themselves into any brutal body creep in latently so that they easily elude the eyes both of justice and the sun for they change themselves into birds and besides this into dogs and rats and even into flies then too they oppress the guardians with sleep by employing dire enchantments nor can any sufficiently define the magnitude of the frauds which they devise for the sake of gratifying their libidinous appetite notwithstanding this however not more than four or six pieces of golden coin are offered as the reward of such a dangerous undertaking and in addition to this, which I had almost forgotten, if he who watches does not on the following morning restore the dead body entire, he is compelled to repair the whole of whatever has been bitten and taken from it, with discurptions from his own face. On hearing this, I invigorated my mind with a masculine strength, and going directly to the crier, I said, Cease to proclaim any father. A guardian is present, ready prepared for you tell me what the recompense will be you will receive said he a thousand pieces of money but be very careful o young man to preserve the dead body of one of the principal persons of this city from most iniquitous harpies you narrate to me i said absurdities and mere trifles you behold in me a man of iron sleepless and certainly more sharp-sighted than lynceus himself or argus and one who is all I. I had scarcely finished when he immediately brought me to a certain house, the gates of which being closed, he introduced me through a narrow back door, and pointed out to me a bedchamber, which was dark in consequence of the window shutters being closed, and a woman clothed in a black garment, weeping, near whom the crier standing said, This man confidently offers to watch the dead body of your husband for the proposed reward, but she, removing to each side the hair that hung down before her face, which even in sorrow was beautiful, and beholding me, said, Endeavour, I beseech you, to perform the office which you have undertaken vigilantly. 
Lay aside all care, I said, and only procure for me some overplus adapted to the labour of my undertaking. To this assenting, she hastily arose, and brought me into another bedchamber. There she disclosed with her hand a dead body that was covered with very white linen, in the presence of seven witnesses who had been introduced into the room, and having wept for a long time, and desired those that were present to bear testimony, she diligently pointed out to them every particular, a certain person at the same time describing in a writing-table the parts of the body which he severally touched for that purpose. Behold, said she, his nose is entire, his eyes are in a sound condition, his ears are safe, his lips have not been violated, and his chin is whole. You worthy citizens, be witnesses of this. And having said this, she sealed the tables and departed. But I said to her, Be so good, madam, as to order that all things may be procured for me which are necessary to this undertaking. What are these? said she. I replied, a large lamp, sufficient oil to supply it with, till it is daylight, warm water with wine vessels and a cup, and a tray furnished with the remains of the supper. Then she, shaking her head, said, Be gone, foolish man, who dost expect supper and the relics of feasting in a house full of sorrow, and in which for so many days no smoke has been seen. Do you think that you have come hither to feast? rather assume as adapted to this place sorrow and tears and at the same time turning to her maid-servant she said mirina immediately give him a lamp and oil and shutting me in the bedchamber she departed i therefore being thus left alone to the solace of the dead body having rubbed my eyes and armed myself to vigilance soothed my mind by singing when lo the twilight commenced the night advanced, still deeper and deeper night, and at length midnight, and my fear became greatly increased. But then a weasel, suddenly creeping into the bedchamber, stood opposite to me, and looked very sharply at me, so that the little animal disturbed my mind by its great audacity. At length, however, I thus spoke to it, Depart, impure beast, and hide yourself with little mice that resemble you, before you experience our powerful blows. Why do you not go away? The animal fled, and immediately left the chamber. But directly after, a profound sleep suddenly merged me into its unfathomable depths, so that not even the Delphic god himself could easily distinguish which of us two that were prostrate was more dead. I, thus inanimate, and requiring another keeper, was nearly not there. Scarcely had the streperous song of the crested cohort proclaimed a truce to-night, when I, being at length roused and terrified in the extreme, ran to the dead body, and taking the lamp with me, and uncovering the face of the corpse, I scrutinised every member, and found all was right. When, lo! the miserable wife entered, weeping, with the witnesses of yesterday, being very solicitous for the event, and immediately falling on the body, and kissing it frequently, and for a long time, she explored everything by the testimony of the lamp. Then, turning herself, she called Philodespotus, the steward of her house, and ordered him to pay me, without delay, the wages of a good guardian. This being immediately presented to me, we give you the greatest thanks, she said, O oh, young man, and by Hercules, for having so well accomplished this undertaking, we shall afterwards rank you among the rest of our domestics. To this, being delighted with the unexpected gain, and astonished at the sight of the glittering pieces of gold, which I frequently shook in my hand, I said, Indeed, madam, you may consider me as one of your servants, and as often as you may be in want of my assistance, confidently command it. I had scarcely thus spoken, when the domestics, execrating the nefarious omen of my words, took up arms of every kind, and pursued me. One began to strike me on the face with his fist, another on the shoulders with his elbows, by some I was kicked, and by others my hair was plucked off, and my garment was lacerated, and thus being mangled and torn in pieces by reproaches and maledictions, like the proud youth Adonis or Orpheus, the son of the muse Calliope, 
I was thrust out of doors, and while I recover myself in the next street, and, and too late call to mind my inauspicious and imprudent speech, and confess that I deserved to suffer even more blows than I had received, behold, the dead body was now carried out, accompanied for the last time by lamentations and clamour and was brought through the forum with all the pomp of a public funeral and according to the rights of his country in consequence of having been one of the principal men of the city to the side of the corpse came a certain old man tearing his native hair and seizing the bier with both hands and with a voice raised indeed but interrupted with continual sighs he proclaimed by your faith o citizens and by your public piety Give assistance to your murdered fellow citizen, and severely revenge a most atrocious deed on this abominable and wicked woman, for she and no other has destroyed by poison this miserable young man, the son of my sister, in order that she might gratify her adulterer, and invade his hereditary possessions. After this manner the old man loudly uttered querulous lamentations interrupted by sobs. In the meantime the common people began to rage and were impelled to a belief of the crime by the probability of its having been committed. They clamorously call for fire, they demand stones, and they incite the boys to the destruction of the woman. But she, loudly lamenting, and adjuring all the divinities in the most sacred manner possible, denied that she had perpetrated so great a crime. The old man therefore said, Let us refer the decision of the truth to divine providence. Saklas the Egyptian is present, who ranks among the first of the prophets, and who agreed with me some time since for a great reward, to recall for a little while the soul of this dead man from the realms beneath, and to reanimate this body. And having thus said, he brought into the midst of the bystanders a certain young man, clothed in linen garments, who had on his feet shoes made from palm leaves woven together, and whose head was entirely shaven. The old man likewise, having for a long time kissed his hands and embraced his knees, said, O oh, priest, take pity on me, I beseech you, by the celestial stars, by the gods of the infernal regions, by the natural elements, by the silence of night, the Coptic enclosures the Nilotic increments, the Memphitic arcana, and the Pharaic sistra. Give to this body a short use of the sun, and infuse a small portion of light in eyes buried in eternal night. We do not wish to resist fate, nor to deny the earth a thing which is her own, but we only request a short space of life as a solace of vengeance. The prophet, being thus rendered propitious, took a certain herb, and laid it thrice on the mouth of the dead body, and placed another on the breast of it. Then, turning himself to the east, and silently imploring the increments of the august sun, he raised the eager attention of those that were present to so great a miracle by the form of such a venerable apparatus. I mingled myself with the crowd, and standing on a certain more elevated stone, which was behind the bier, I observed everything with inquisitive eyes. And now the breast of the corpse began to swell with respiration, the salubrious vein to have pulsation, and the body to be filled with spirit. The corpse also arose, and thus spoke to the young man, why, I beseech you, do you bring me back to the offices of a momentary life, after I have drunk of the Lethean cup, and have swum over the Stygian marshes? Desist, I pray you, now desist, and suffer me to remain in my rest. These words were heard from the body. But the prophet, being a little more excited, said, Why do you not narrate everything to this crowd, and disclose the secrets of your death? Do you not think that the furies can be called forth by my imprecations, and that your wearied limbs may be tormented? To this the reanimated body answered from the bier, and thus with a groan addressed the people. I was destroyed by the nefarious arts of a new wife, and being compelled to take an envenomed potion, I delivered to an adulterer my yet tepid bed.
Then the egregious wife assumed confidence from the present circumstances, and resisting, with a sacrilegious mind, contends against her confuting husband. The vulgar are inflamed and divided into contrary parties. These contend that the most execrable woman should be immediately buried alive with the body of her husband. Others are of opinion that no credit should be given to the lying testimony of a dead body. The subsequent speech, however, of the corpse dissolved this contest, for again profoundly groaning it said, I will give you, I will give you manifest documents of unviolated truth, and will indicate to you what is known to no one else. Then pointed to me with his finger, When this most sagacious guardian, said he, of my body, diligently watched over me, old enchantresses, ardently longing after the spoil of my members, and on this account having frequently been in vain changed into other forms, when they found they could not deceive his sedulous attention, having at length thrown over him the dark mist of drowsiness, and buried him in profound sleep, they did not cease to call me by my name, till my infirm joints and cold members struggled by sluggish endeavours to obey the mandates of the magic art. Then this man, who was alive indeed, but dead only with sleep, because he had the same denomination with myself, rose, ignorant of what had been transacted on hearing his name, and spontaneously walking like an inanimate shadow, though the doors of the bedchamber were carefully closed, suffered mutilation instead of me. His nose first, and afterwards his ears, being amputated through a certain chink, and that other things might correspond with the fraud, they accurately adapted to him wax, fashioned in the shape of his mutilated ears, and provided him with a waxen nose similar to his own. And now the miserable man stands here, having obtained the reward, not of his vigilance, but of his mutilation. On hearing this, I, being terrified, began to try my fortune. With my hand I take hold of my nose, it follows my hand, I touch my ears, and they fall off, and while I am pointed out by the direct fingers and oblique nods of those that were present, while there was an ebullition of laughter, I escape between the feet of the surrounding crowd, wet with frigid perspiration. Nor, being thus mutilated and exposed to ridicule, could I return to my paternal abode, but with my hair falling on each side of my face, I concealed the wounds of my ears, and covered the disgrace of my nose with this linen cloth closely applied to it. As soon as Telephron had brought this narration to an end, all the inebriated guests were again dissolved in laughter and while they asked permission to drink the health of their friends, Birina thus addressed me. "'Tomorrow comes as a day, which it has been usual to celebrate from the earliest infancy of this city, on which day we alone of all men propitiate the most sacred god of laughter with hilarity and mirth. Your presence will render him more pleasing to us, and I wish you could devise anything from your own proper pleasantry of a joyous nature in honour of the God, in order that we might, in a greater and more perfect degree, please so great a divinity. It is well, I said, and what you request shall be done, and by Hercules I wish I could invent something very festive which might excite immoderate laughter. After this, being myself distended with much wine, I immediately rise, through the admonition of my servants, who informed me that it was now night, and having hastily bid farewell to Birina, I proceed homeward with staggering steps. And while we go through the first broad street, the torch to which we trusted was extinguished by a sudden blast of wind, so that, being scarcely liberated from the darkness of unexpected night, it was with difficulty and weariness that we could reach our home, our toes frequently striking against the stones. 
but when we now drew nearer to our street behold three men of strong and vast bodies rushed with greatest violence against our gate and were not in the smallest degree terrified by our presence but frequently attacked it with a greater accumulation of force so that to all of us and especially to me they appeared to be robbers and of the most cruel description immediately therefore i seize a sword liberated from my bosom and which i carried with me concealed in my garments for these purposes without delay i threw myself into the midst of the robbers and plunged my sword profoundly into the body of each that presented himself in the contest till at length they expired before my feet pierced with many and deep wounds and when i had thus fought fotis being awakened by the tumult and having opened the gate i entered into the house breathing with difficulty and wet with perspiration immediately also i delivered myself to bed and sleep being as much fatigued with the slaughter of the stubborn robbers as if i had killed the tricorporal gerion End of chapter two part two part one of the metamorphosis or golden ass this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for further information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the metamorphosis or golden ass by lucius apuleius translated by thomas taylor chapter three part one now aurora rode through the heavens lashing with rosy hand her horses decked with ruddy trappings and night restored me snatched from secure quiet to the day but my mind was in a fluctuating state from the recollection of the deed which i had perpetrated in the evening at length however collecting my feet under me joining together my hands upon my knees with my fingers twined in each other and thus sitting on my bed i wept abundantly now representing to myself in my imagination the forum the judicial processes the condemnation and lastly the executioner shall i find said i to myself any judge so mild and so benevolent as to be able to pronounce me innocent who am imbrued with the blood of a triple homicide and defiled with the gore of so many citizens this is the journey which the chaldean diophanes pertinaciously proclaimed would be to me glorious frequently revolving these things with myself i deplored my fortune in the meantime there was a violent knocking at our doors and a great tumult before our gate and without delay a great eruption being made into the house every part of it was filled with magistrates and their attendants and a miscellaneous crowd immediately also two of the lictors laying hold of me by order of the magistrates led me along without any resistance on my part and when we came into the next street immediately all the city pouring forth in a great crowd followed us in a wonderfully compact body and though i walked sorrowfully with my head inclined to the ground or rather to the realms beneath yet by looking obliquely i saw a thing altogether admirable for among so many thousands of people that surrounded me there was not any one who was not ready to burst with laughter at length having passed through all the streets and after the manner of those who with lustral sacrifices expiate by circumforaneous victims the anger of the gods being led by an angular circumduction into the forum i was placed by the tribunal and now the magistrates were seated in the lofty pulpit now the public crier proclaimed silence when suddenly all the assembly with one voice requested that a cause of so much consequence might be tried in the theatre on account of the concourse of the people which might be attended with danger from its multitude and compression immediately the people everywhere running to the theatre filled the seats of it with a wonderful celerity the entrances also and the whole of the building were crowded a great part of the populace stood clinging to the pillars some were pendant from the statues others were half conspicuous from the windows and the beams of the building 
and all through an ardent desire of seeing, paid no attention to their own safety. Then the public ministers led me through the middle of the proscenium, like some victim, and placed me in the midst of the orchestra. A certain accuser, therefore, who was of an advanced age, being again called by the loud bellowing of the crier, rose up, and having poured water into a certain vessel, which was slenderly perforated like a strainer, and through which water flowed by drops, for the purpose of limiting the time of speaking, thus addressed the people. A transaction is now brought before you, O most holy citizens, which is by no means of a trifling nature, but especially regards the peace of the whole city, and which, by a weighty example, will be profitable to others. Hence it will be most proper that all and each of you should endeavour for the public dignity, that this nefarious homicide may not go unpunished, for having cruelly slain so many of the citizens." nor must you think that I have been induced by any private grudge to accuse him more bitterly from a peculiar hatred. For I am the prefect of the night guard, nor do I believe that my sedulous vigilance hitherto can be blamed by any one. I will therefore faithfully narrate the transaction itself, and the deeds that were perpetrated this night. When, about the third watch, I had gone round the whole city, observing everything with exact diligence from door to door, I beheld this most cruel young man everywhere committing homicide with his drawn sword, and three persons, having been now ferociously slain by him, were laid before his feet, still breathing, and their bodies leaping in an abundance of gore and he indeed being justly alarmed by the consciousness of so dire a deed, immediately fled, and having escaped into a certain house through the protection of darkness, was there concealed during the whole of the night. By the providence of the gods, however, which never suffers the guilty to go unpunished, I took care, before he had clandestinely escaped, to bring him, as soon as it was morning, before your venerable tribunal. You have therefore before you an accused person, one who is defiled with so many murders, one who is evidently guilty, and one who is an arraigned stranger. Courageously, therefore, pass sentence on a foreigner for that crime for the commission of which you would severely punish one of your own citizens. My most bitter accuser, having thus spoken, stopped his loud voice. But immediately after, the crier ordered me to begin to speak, if I wished to make any reply to what had been said. I, however, at that time could do no more than weep, not by Hercules so much looking to my terrible accusation as to my miserable conscience. Nevertheless, assuming a divinely inspired boldness, I answered as follows. I am not ignorant how difficult it is for one who is accused of the murder of three citizens to persuade so great a multitude that he is innocent, though he should speak the truth and voluntarily confess the fact. But if your humanity will allow me a public audience for a short time, I can easily show you that I have sustained the danger of my life, not for having deserved to lose it, but through the fortuitous event of a reasonable indignation which has unjustly caused me to be accused of so great a crime. For, as I was returning from supper, somewhat later than usual, and besides this being intoxicated, which I will not deny was truly my crime, I beheld before the gates of my lodging, but I dwell with your worthy fellow-citizen Milo, certain most cruel robbers attempting to gain an entrance and to pluck the doors of the house from the hinges, and having with great violence torn off all the bars by which the doors were fastened, they deliberated with themselves concerning the destruction of the inhabitants. Lastly, one of them, who was more prompt with his hands and larger in his body, incited the others by these words, Hark ye, my lads, let us attack those within the house while they are asleep, with manly minds and active strength. Let all doubt and all sluggishness be banished from our breast. Let slaughter stalk with a drawn sword through the whole house. Let him who lies asleep be slain, and him who endeavours to resist be knocked down. Thus we shall depart from hence safe, if we leave no one in safety in the house. 
I confess, O citizens, I thought it was the duty of a good member of the community, as through fearing exceedingly both for myself and my hosts, I was armed with a sword which I carried with me on account of dangers of this kind, that I should endeavour to put to flight and terrify these most iniquitous robbers. But these perfectly barbarous and atrocious men by no means betook themselves to flight, and though they saw that I was armed, yet they audaciously resisted. The battle is arrayed, and at length the leader and standard-bearer of the rest, having attacked me with great force, immediately endeavoured to beat me down with a stone, having seized me by the hair with both his hands, and caused me to recline backward. But while he strove to obtain the stone, I, with a sure hand, happily laid him prostrate, and soon after I slew another, who was adhering to and biting my feet, with a blow levelled at the middle of his shoulder-blade, and the third I pierced in the breast, as he was incautiously running against me. Thus peace being vindicated, and the house of my host, and the common safety being protected, I believed that I should not only be without punishment, but also that I should be thought worthy of the public praise, for I have never been accused even of the smallest crime, but have always been respected by my acquaintance, and have always preferred innocence to every earthly good. Nor am I able to discover why I now undergo this accusation of a just revenge, which I was incited to take against the worst of robbers, since no one can prove either that prior to this affair there was any private enmity between us, or that those robbers were ever at all known by me, or certainly some spoil should be shown, through the desire of obtaining which, it may be believed, that I perpetrated such an unlawful deed. Having thus said, tears again bursting forth, and with my hands suppliantly extended, I sorrowfully deprecated now these, and then those, by the public pity, and by the love of those dear pledges, their children. And when I thought that all of them were now moved by humanity, and were sufficiently affected by the commiseration of my tears, calling to witness the eye of justice and the sun, and commending to the providence of the gods my present casualty, when I had raised my eyes a little higher, I beheld all the people ready to burst into loud laughter, and also my good host and father Milo, dissolving as well as the rest into excessive laughter. But I then said silently to myself, Alas, where is faith, where is conscience? I indeed am a homicide, and am capitally convicted, for the safety of my host. He, however, not content that he has not afforded me the solace of defence, laughs at my destruction. In the meantime a certain woman, arrayed in black, ran through the middle of the theatre, weeping and lamenting, and carrying in her bosom an infant and behind her was another old woman, in ragged and filthy garments, who also testified her grief by similar lamentations. Both of them also shook with their hands branches of olive, which were scattered about the bier on which the dead bodies were laid, and beating their breasts and mournfully weeping, exclaimed, By the public compassion, by the common law of humanity, take pity on these young men who are unworthily slain, and give to our widowhood and solitude the solace of revenge. At least afford assistance to the miserable fortune of this infant, who is left destitute in the first years of his life, and make a propitiatory sacrifice to your laws and public discipline, with the blood of this robber. Afterwards the magistrate, who was the elder, arose and thus addressed the people. Concerning the crime, indeed, which must be severely punished, he who committed it cannot deny it. One only care, however, remains for us, and which is also of a secondary nature, that we should search after the other persons who were the associates of the accused, in the perpetration of so great a crime. For it is not probable that one man alone could have deprived of life three such robust young men. The truth, therefore, must be extorted by torments. For the servant who attended the accused has privately fled, and the thing is brought to this issue, 
that he may by torture be compelled to declare who were the partakers of his wickedness, in order that the dread of so dire a faction may be entirely removed. And without any delay, fire and the wheel, after the manner of the Greeks, and afterwards every kind of whips were introduced. My sorrow was very much increased, or rather was doubled, because I was not permitted to die entire. But that old woman, who had disturbed everything by her weeping, said, O oh, best of citizens, before you fix to the cross this destroyer of my unhappy sons, suffer the dead bodies of the slain to be uncovered, that being more and more incited to a just indignation by an inspection of the form, and at the same time of the age of the deceased, you may treat him with a severity proportioned to the magnitude of the crime. These words were applauded, and immediately the judge ordered me to uncover with my hand the dead bodies which were placed on the bed. The lictors, by the command of the magistrates, instantly compelled me, in consequence of my struggling, and for a long time resisting, the renovation of the preceding crime by a new exhibition. Lastly, therefore, taking hold of my right hand, they extended it to my destruction on the dead bodies. At length, vanquished by necessity, I yield, and though unwilling, snatching off the pall, I disclosed the bodies. But, good gods, what an appearance did the thing assume! What a prodigy! What a sudden change of fortune! For, as I was now in the possession of Proserpine, and was considered as one of the family of Pluto, I suddenly became stupefied with wonder on finding things assume such a contrary aspect nor could I, in appropriate words, explain the form of this new spectacle. For those bodies of the men that were slain were three inflated bladders, mangled in different parts, and as far as I could remember of my vespertine battle, they were cut in those places in which I appeared to myself to have wounded the robbers. Then the laughter, which, through the cunning of certain persons, had been for a short time repressed, burst forth unrestrained among the people. Some exceedingly rejoiced, others, by the compression of their hands, mitigated the pain of their belly, and all of them leave the theatre full of joy, and at the same time looking back on me. But I, from the time that I laid hold of the pall, stood fixed and cold like a stone, no otherwise than one of the other statues or columns of the theatre nor did I emerge from the infernal realms till my host Milo came, and took me by the hand, and with gentle force drew me with him, reluctant as I was, and frequently sobbing, and again weeping. He likewise brought me to his house through certain winding ways, having for this purpose selected the most solitary streets, and by various conversation consoled me, who was still sad, and even then trembling nor could he by any means mitigate my indignation of the injury I had sustained, and which stuck more profoundly in my mind. But lo, the magistrates themselves, with their insignia, immediately entering into our house, strove to appease by addressing me as follows. We are not ignorant, O Lucius, of your dignity or your lineage, for the nobility of your illustrious family is extended through the whole of this province nor have you, for the sake of contumely, suffered that for which you so excessively grieve. Dismiss, therefore, all the present sorrow from your breast, and expel this anguish from your mind. For this jest, which we solemnly celebrate in public every year, in honour of the most pleasant god of laughter, always flourishes with some new invention. The god also everywhere propitiously and lovingly attends the author of the invention, nor will he ever suffer you to be oppressed with mental grief, but will perpetually exhilarate your countenance with a serene gracefulness. All this city likewise will reward you with the greatest honour for the favour which you have conferred on them, for it will denominate you its patron by public decree, and will ordain that a brazen statue of you shall be erected. To these words I answered, to you indeed, O most splendid and principal city of Thessaly, I shall be mindful that my gratitude may be equivalent to such honours. 
but let me persuade you to keep statues and images for those who are more worthy and more excellent than I am. Having spoken thus modestly, and for a little while smiling with a cheerful countenance, and pretending as much as possible to be joyful, I courteously bade the departing magistrates farewell. And behold, a certain servant running into the house said to me, Your mother Birina requests you to take notice that the hour of the banquet is approaching, at which you promised yesterday to be present. But I, trembling at these words, and abhorring her house even at a distance, said, Tell your mistress that I would most willingly comply with her request, if I could do so without violating my promise. For my host, Milo, conjuring me by the most powerful divinity, who presides over this day, compelled me to promise that I would sup with him this evening. Nor does he leave me, nor will he suffer me, to depart from him. On this account I must defer supping with her to another time. While I was yet thus speaking to the servant, Milo, taking me firmly by the hand, brought me to the next bath, having previously ordered that the bathing utensils should be sent to us when we were there. But I, avoiding the eyes of all men, and declining the laughter of those I met, and of which I had been the artificer, walked covertly by his side. Nor did I remember how I washed or wiped myself, or how I again returned home. Such was the shame that I felt, and so much was I astounded on seeing myself pointed out by the eyes, the nods, and the fingers of all men. Lastly, having hastily taken a small supper with Milo, and excusing myself on account of a great pain in my head, occasioned by my continual weeping, and this excuse being readily granted, I betook myself to rest. End of chapter 3, part 1chapter 3 part 2 of the metamorphosis or golden ass this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ted garvin the metamorphosis or golden ass by pulius translated by thomas taylor chapter 3 part 2 lying therefore sorrowful in my bed I revolved in my mind all that had happened to me, till at length my Photis, having put her mistress to bed, came to me very much unlike herself, for she did not bring with her a joyful face, nor mirthful speech, but came with a sorrowful aspect and wrinkled forehead. Lastly, having spoke doubtfully and timidly, she said, I, of my own accord, confess that I have been the cause to you of this molestation and immediately she drew a whip from her bosom and extending it to me said revenge yourself i beseech you on a perfidious woman or rather inflict on me some greater punishment nevertheless do not i entreat you believe that i voluntarily occasioned you this anguish and sorrow may the gods be more favourable to me than that you should suffer on my account the smallest anxiety and if anything adverse is likely to befall you may the whole of it be immediately washed away with my blood and if anything adverse is likely to befall you, may the whole of it be immediately washed away with my blood. But that, which I was ordered to do, for the sake of another thing, has, through my evil destiny, been converted to your injury. Then I, being urged by my usual curiosity, and longing to have the latent cause of this deed unfolded, thus answered, That whip, the most iniquitous and audacious of all things, which you have destined to scourge yourself with, shall be destroyed being broken into pieces by me, before it shall touch your most soft and milk-white skin. But tell me faithfully, I beseech you, what deed of yours the malignity of fortune converted to my destruction. For I swear by your head, which is most dear to me, that I would not believe any one who should assert that you have thought of anything baneful to me, nor would I give credit to it, though you yourself should affirm it. Moreover, uncertain, or even adverse events, cannot cause innoxious thoughts to become the subject of blame. When I had finished these words, I thirstily imbibed love from the eyes of my photos, which were moist and tremulous, faint with precipitate lust, and half open, through ardent and absorbing kisses. So she, being refreshed with joy, said, Suffer me, I beseech you, in the first place, carefully to shut the door of the bedchamber, lest I should commit a great crime, through the profane petulance of the words that may fall from me. 
and having thus said, she barred and firmly bolted the door, and thus, returning to me, and embracing my neck with both her hands, she said to me, in a low and very diminished tone of voice, I fear, and profoundly tremble, to disclose the hidden affairs of this house, and to reveal the arcane secrets of my mistress. But I anticipate better things of you in your erudition, who, independently of the superior dignity of your birth, and the sublimity of your genius, are initiated in many sacred mysteries, and consequently know the sacred faith of silence. Whatever, therefore, I shall commit to the penetralia of this religious breast of yours, I beseech you to preserve perpetually shut within its recesses, and to remunerate the simplicity of my narration by the tenacity of your taciturnity, for the power of love, by which I am bound to you, compels me to indicate those things to you, which, of all mortals, are known to me alone. Now you shall know all the state of our house, now you shall know the wonderful secrets of my mistress, to which the souls of the dead are obedient, and the elements are subservient, and by which the stars are disturbed, and the divinities are compelled. Nor does she ever employ the force of this art in a greater degree than when she has lustfully beheld a young man, of a graceful form, which is the thing that happens to her frequently. Now also she vehemently loves a certain Boeotian youth, who is beautiful in the extreme, and, in order to allure him, ardently employs all the power and machinations of her art. I heard her, yesterday, in the evening, I heard her, I say, with these my own ears, threaten the sun with nebulous obscurity and perpetual darkness, if he did not more rapidly set, and sooner give place to the night, so as to afford her an opportunity of exercising the enchantments of magic. Yesterday she accidentally beheld this youth, sitting in a barber's shop, as she was returning from the bath, and ordered me secretly to take away his hairs, which then lay on the ground, and had been cut off by the scissors. These the barber found me diligently and furtively collecting, and because we were in other respects publicly infamous, through exercising the malefic discipline, he took hold of, and severely reproved me. Will you not cease, O most infamous woman, he said, to seal the hairs of beautiful young men? Unless, however, you desist from this wickedness, I will take you, without delay, before the magistrates. And following his words by deeds, he explored with his hands, and drew out, enraged, from between my breasts, the hair which was there concealed. Being grievously affected by this deed, and considering with myself the manners of my mistress, who is accustomed to be excessively enraged, and to beat me most cruelly, when she is disappointed in a thing of this kind, I deliberated about making my escape, but on your account I immediately rejected that design. When, however, I departed from thence, sorrowful lest I should return with hands perfectly empty, I beheld a certain person shearing, with a pair of scissors, the skins of goats. And when I saw that these were properly bound together, were inflated, and stood of their own accord, I took a sufficient quantity of the hairs of them, which were scattered on the ground, and were yellow, and therefore similar to those of the Boeotian youth. And these I delivered to my mistress, dissembling the truth. So at the beginning of the night, before you departed from supper, Pamphile, my mistress, being now beside herself, ascended into a gallery which was covered with narrow pieces of wood instead of tiles. This gallery, which she privately frequents, is situated in the higher part of the house, has an aperture exposed to the winds, and a prospect of the eastern and all the other climates of the world, especially adapted to these arts. And in the first place she adorned her deadly workshop with its usual apparatus, viz. with every kind of aromatics, with plates of metal engraved with unknown characters, with nails taken from shipwrecked vessels, and with the members of many lamented bodies exposed to the open air, and also of those that had been buried. Here were noses and fingers, there the nails by which culprits had been fixed to the cross, and to which portions of flesh adhered, and in another place the blood of those was preserved that had been slain, and mangled skulls snatched from the teeth of wild beasts. Then, having charmed the yet breathing fibers, she made a libation with different liquors, at one time with fontal water, at another with the milk of cows, and at another with mountain honey. She likewise made a libation with mead. After this she committed to the live coals to be burnt, with many aromatics, those plaited goat hairs. And then, with the unconquerable power of the magic discipline, and the occult force of the gods, who were compelled by incantations, those bodies, the hairs of which smoked with a crashing noise, were immediately changed into a human form, and became sentient, and heard and walked. Where also the scent of their spoils attracted them, 
with thither they came and desiring to enter the house in the place of the young boeotian they knock at the gate when lo you being intoxicated and deceived by the darkness of the night and bravely armed with a drawn sword like insane ajax yet not lacerating whole herds as he did who was hostile to live cattle but far more bold you deprived of life three inflated goat skins in order that your adversaries being laid prostrate without any stain of blood i might now embrace you not as a homicide but as a slayer of bladders and thus through the facetious narration of photis merrily jesting with each other i said now therefore i may enumerate this as the first glory which my fortitude has obtained and which is as it were one of the twelve labors of hercules so that my prowess in having slain three bladders may be considered as co-equal to the destruction of the tricorporal geryon or the three-headed cerebus in order however that i may sincerely and willingly pardon you for the fault through which you involve me in such great anguish of mine accomplish what i most ardently desire and show me your mistress when she attempts anything pertaining to this divine magic discipline so that when she invokes the gods i may at least see her changed into another form for i am most vehemently desirous of obtaining a nearer and more accurate knowledge of magic though you yourself do not appear to me to be ignorant of and unskilled in things of this kind for i know and perfectly experience in myself that you are not destitute of this knowledge since you detain me voluntarily bound and subjected to you like a slave as i have always despised matronal embraces by those bright eyes of yours and by your ruddy lips splendid hair open mouth kisses and fragrant breasts lastly i neither am anxious to return home nor am i making any preparations for that purpose nor is there anything which i prefer to this night to this she replied how much do i wish o lucius to effect that which you desire but my mistress on account of the envy and malevolence of others has always been accustomed to perform such arcana alone remote from the sight of every one i prefer however the gratification of your request to my own safety and i will diligently accomplish what you wish exploring for this purpose a fit opportunity do you only as i at first admonished you faithfully preserve in silence a thing of such great consequence and now sleep being infused into our eyes which were enfeebled with wakefulness detained us in bed till it was broad day having passed a few nights voluptuously after this manner photis on a certain day ran to me agitated and trembling exceedingly and informed me that her mistress because she had not hitherto made any proficiency in her amours by other arts would on the following night assume wings and be changed into a bird and would thus transformed fly to the object of her love i cautiously therefore prepared myself for the survey of a thing of such importance and now towards the beginning of the night photis brought me with doubtful and silent steps to that lofty chamber and ordered me to look through a certain chink of the door that i might see what was transacted and in the first place indeed pamphile divested herself of all her garments and having opened a certain small chest took from thence many boxes from one of which the covering being removed she rubbed herself for a long time with an ointment contained in it from the extremities of her feet to the crown of her head when also with the lamp in her hand she had said much in a low voice she shook her limbs with a tremulous agitation and from these lightly fluctuating soft feathers extend themselves and strong wings burst forth the nose is hardened and incurvated the nails are compressed and made crooked and pafil becomes an owl being thus changed and emitting a querulous sound she made a trial of herself and gradually leapt from the earth and soon after being raised on high she flew out of doors with all the force of her wings thus she indeed was voluntarily changed by her own magic arts but i who was not enchanted by any magic words but only astounded at what was then transacted seemed to be anything else rather than lucius thus being exterminated from intellect and astonished even to insanity i was dreaming though awake so that for a long time rubbing my eyes i endeavoured to ascertain whether i was in a vigilant state at length therefore returning to an animate aversion of the present transactions i took hold of the right hand of photis and applying it to my eyes i said suffer me i beseech you to reap the great and singular fruit of your love while the occasion offers and give me a little ointment from the same box this my sweetest i entreat you to grant by those eyes of mine 
which are devoted to you and thus by conferring on me a benefit which can never be remunerated bind me to you a perpetual slave and now cause it to come to pass that i may stand near you my venus a winged cupid would you said she my paramour act fraudulently by me and compel me voluntarily to throw an axe at my legs shall i thus preserve my lucius for the thessalian virgins where shall i seek for him when he is changed into a bird when shall i see him may the celestial powers i said avert from me that crime that i who born on eagle's wings should be able to fly through all heaven and be the sure messenger of jupiter or the joyful bearer of thunder should not after i had obtained this dignity of wings frequently fly to my nest i swear to you by that sweet little knot of your hair with which you have bound my spirit that i prefer no other female to my photos this also occurs to my thoughts that when once being rubbed with that ointment i am changed into a bird of that kind i e into an owl i ought to avoid all houses for what a beautiful and agreeable lover will an owl be to matrons do we not also see that these nocturnal birds when they have entered into any house are solicitously caught and nailed to the doors that by their torments they may expiate the calamity which they pretend to the family by their inauspicious flight but tell me what i had almost forgot to inquire what i must say or do in order that i may return to this my form of lucius having divested myself of those wings be not solicitous she said about this for my mistress has shown to me everything which can again change such forms into the human shape you must not however think that she did this through any benevolence towards me but in order that i might be able to afford her a salutary remedy when she returns home lastly consider with what small and frivolous herbs a thing of such magnitude is affected for a little of the herb dill put into fountain water with the leaves of the laurel is given as a lotion and also to drink having frequently asserted this she went into the bedchamber with great trepidation and took out a box from the chest which i having first embraced and kissed and prayed that it would favour me with prosperous flights hastily divested myself of all my garments and having ardently put my hand into it and taken from thence a sufficient quantity of the ointment i rubbed with it the members of my body and now balancing my arms with alternate efforts i longed to be changed into a similar bird no plumes however nor any wings germinated but my hairs became evidently thickened into bristles my tender skin was hardened into a hide and the extremity of my hands all my fingers having lost their number coalesced into several hoofs and a long tail proceeded from the extremity of my spine my face was now enormous my mouth was long and my lips immoderate and pendant thus also my ears increased excessively and were clothed with rough hairs and while destitute of all hope i consider the whole of my body i see that i am not a bird but an ass and complaining of the deed of photis but being deprived both of the human gesture and voice i silently expostulated with her which was all i could do with my underlip hanging down and beheld her sternly and obliquely yet with humid eyes but she as soon as she beheld me thus changed struck her forehead with her addicted hands and exclaimed wretch that i am i am undone trepidation and at the same time festination have beguiled me and the similarity of the boxes has deceived me it is well however that a remedy for this transformation may be easily obtained for by only chewing roses you will put off the form of an ass and will immediately become again my lucius and i wish i had prepared for this evening according to my custom some garlands of roses for then you would not have suffered the delay even of one night but as soon as it is morning a remedy shall hastily be procured for you after this manner she lamented but i though i was a complete ass and instead of lucius a labouring beast yet retained human sense lastly i deliberated much and for a long time with myself whether i ought not to slay that most iniquitous and wicked woman by frequently kicking and biting her but better thoughts recalled me from the rash design lest by punishing photus with death i should again extinguish for myself salutary succour shaking therefore my dejected head dissembling my temporary injury and submitting to my most severe misfortune i betake myself to that most excellent horse in the stable on which i rode where also i found another ass dwelling who belonged to my late host milo and i thought that this my horse if there is in dumb animals any secret and natural fidelity 
would, being impelled by a certain knowledge and pity, afford me a lodging and the rights of hospitality. But by Jupiter Hospitalis and the secret divinity of faith, that excellent horse of mine and the ass moved their heads towards each other and immediately consented to my destruction. For when they beheld me approaching to the manger, with my ears fallen, they furiously attacked me with hostile heels, fearing for their food. And I am driven far away from that barley which, in the evening, I had placed with my own hands before that most grateful servant. Being thus treated and expelled to a solitary place, I went to a corner of the stable. While I reflect with myself on the insolence of my companions, and meditate vengeance on my perfidious horse, when, on the following day, I should become Lucius again by the assistance of roses, I beheld a resemblance to the goddess of Pona, placed in an excavation or niche, in the middle of a pillar, which, also having a middle situation, supported the beams of the stable. This image was carefully adorned with garlands of roses, which had been recently gathered. At length, therefore, recognizing my salutary aid, I boldly rise, precipitately borne along with hope, making all the exertion I could, with my four feet extended and stretching out my neck, and very much advancing my lips, I most strenuously endeavored to snatch the garlands. While, however, I was endeavoring to accomplish this, my boy, to whose care my horse had always been committed, suddenly beholding me, indignantly arose and said, How long shall we endure this vile ass, who, a little before, was hostile to the food of the laboring beast, and now attacks even the statues of the gods? But I will now cause this sacrilegious beast to be both weak and lame, and immediately searching for something with which he might strike me, he found a bundle of wood, accidentally lying there, and selecting from thence a leafy staff, larger than all the rest, he did not cease to beat me, unfortunate as I was, till being frightened by a loud knocking at the doors, and a great tumult, and by the trembling voices of the neighbors, exclaiming there were thieves, he betook himself to flight. And without delay, a band of robbers, having entered the house by violence, seized on everything in it, and an armed multitude surrounded all the parts of the house. The robbers also, running everywhere, opposed themselves to those who flew to give assistance. All of them being furnished with swords and torches, illuminate the night, and the coruscations of swords resembled the light emitted by the rising sun. Then attacking a certain treasury, firmly closed with very strong bars, which was placed in the middle of the house, and was filled with the wealth of Milo, they broke it open with powerful axes. And from this, when completely opened, they took away all the riches, and divided them among themselves, having hastily tied the bundles into which the portions of the booty were made. The multitude of the bundles, however, surpassed the number of those that were to carry them. Then being brought to extreme poverty, through too great an abundance of wealth, they led forth us two asses and my horse from the stable, loaded us with the heaviest burdens they could, and expelled us with the blows of staves from the house which was now empty leaving also one of their companions behind as a spy, who might inform them what inquiry was made about the robbery, they led us rapidly, and at the same time frequently beating us, through the trackless paths of the mountains. And now I, through the weight of things of such magnitude, and through the difficulty of ascending to the summit of the mountain, and the length of the way, was not in any respect different from a dead body. It occurred to me, however, late indeed, but seriously, that I should fly to civil aid, and liberate myself from so many miseries, by invoking the venerable name of the emperor. At length, it being now broad daylight, as we passed through a certain populous village, which was much frequent on account of fairs, I tried to invoke the august name of Caesar, in the midst of a crowd of Greeks, but I could only utter the letter O, clearly and strongly, and was not able to enunciate the name of Caesar. The robbers also, despising my dissonant clamor, and striking in all parts my miserable hide, left it at length, through laceration, not even fit for the purpose of a sieve. But at length Jupiter, whose providence extends to all things, procured for me unexpected safety. For while I passed by many small farms and large houses, I beheld a certain very pleasant little garden, in which, besides other delectable plants, there were virgin roses, wet with morning dew. Ardently desiring these, and brisk and joyful with the hope of safety, I came nearer to them. And while, with undulating lips, I longed to eat them, a far more salutary thought occurred to me, viz., that if I should again become Lucius, being divested of the asinine form, I should meet with certain destruction by the hands of the robbers, who would either suspect me of being skilled in the magic art, 
or with fear that I should betray them by my accusation. At that time, therefore, I necessarily abstained from roses, and enduring my present fortune, bit my bridle under the form of an ass. End of chapter 3, part 2《ハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッハッ When the power of the sun causes everything to be hot, we turned into a certain village to some old men who were known by and familiar with the robbers. For their first salutation, their long conference, and their mutual kisses enabled me to perceive this, though I was an ass. For they presented them with gifts from the things which were on my back, and by whispers seemed to indicate that these gifts were obtained by plunder. And now, having lightened us of all our burden, They sent us into the nearest meadow that we might there freely feed. Society and feeding, however, could not detain me with the ass or with my horse because I was as yet unaccustomed to eat hay. But as I was now perishing with hunger, I boldly entered into a little garden which I saw behind the stable and filled my belly abundantly with pot herbs, though they were raw. Invoking likewise all the gods, I inspected every place. In order to see if by chance I could find in the neighboring gardens some rose trees resplendent with a fiery redness. For the solitude of my situation now afforded me good hope that if, being removed from the public road and concealed by groves of trees, I should, by taking the remedy, be raised on my feet, I should then, unseen by any one, be again transformed into the human shape from the prone step of a four footed beast. Whilst, therefore, I was fluctuating in that sea of thought, I beheld, a little further, a valley shaded by a leafy grove, among the various plants and most pleasant verdure of which, the bright color of red roses shone forth to the view. And now in my breast, which was not entirely brutal, I thought that the grove was sacred to Venus and the Graces, in whose shady recesses the royal splendor of that genial flower, the rose, was reticent. Then, having invoked joyful and prosperous event, I ran rapidly, so that by Hercules I myself thought that I was not an ass, but that, through excessive velocity, I was changed into a swift horse. That agility, however, an excellent endeavor of mine could not prevent the malignity of my fate. For when I was now nearer to this place, I no longer saw those fresh and delectable roses, wet with divine dew and nectar, which felicitous brambles and blessed thorns produce. Nor did I behold any valley, but only the margin of a river's bank, environed with thick set trees. These trees had oblong leaves like the laurel, and produced extended and reddish cups, after the manner of a flower that has no scent, which, nevertheless, are fragrant, are called by the unlearned vulgar, by a name not at all rustic, laurel roses, and when eaten, are deadly to all cattle. Being entangled with such adverse fates, and rejecting even safety itself, I spontaneously longed to eat of those in the venom roses, but while I slowly approached in order to pluck them, a certain young man, who, as it appeared to me, was a gardener, perceiving the great loss he had sustained by my having destroyed all his herbs, fiercely ran to me with a great staff in his hand, and taking hold of me, inflicted on me so many blows that I should have been in danger of losing my life. Unless I had at length prudently given assistance to myself. For with my posterior parts elevated, I frequently kicked him with my hind feet, and having severely punished him, and laid him prostrate at the foot of the next mountain, I liberated myself by flight. Immediately, however, a certain woman, viz. the wife of the gardener, as soon as she beheld him from an eminence, prostrate and half dead, flew to him with lamentation and howling, in order that by her own commiseration she might be the occasion of my present destruction. For all the rustics, being excited by her lamentations, immediately called out their dogs, and everywhere incited them, that being driven by fury, they might rush upon and tear me in pieces. I therefore, being without doubt at that time near to death, when I saw that the dogs, who were congregated and exasperated against me, were large and numerous, and fit to fight with bears and lions, availing myself of the counsel suggested by the existing circumstance, put an end to my flight, and again, with rapid steps, returned to the stable from which I came. 
but the rustics having seized me the dogs being with difficulty restrained and bound me with a very strong thong of leather to the staple of a post would without doubt have scourged me to death if my belly compressed by the pain of the blows filled with those raw herbs and disordered with a slippery flux had not by ejecting dung as though through a tube driven away some besprinkling them and others by the fetid odour which was emitted from my now broken shoulders and without delay it being now nearly noon the robbers again led us from the stable heavily laden and especially me whose burden was far greater than that of the rest now also when a good part of the journey was finished i being exhausted with the length of the way oppressed with the weight of the burden and fatigued with the blows of the staffs and likewise now being lame and staggering from the worn-out condition of my hoofs as i was walking near a certain rivulet of gently flowing and winding water i thought having happily found an excellent opportunity i would kindly lie down with my legs bent under me fully determined not to rise from thence whatever blows might be inflicted on me and being also prepared not only to be beaten but to die pierced with the sword for i thought that being now perfectly exhausted and debile i should be dismissed on account of bodily infirmity or that the robbers would certainly divide the burden which i carried on my back between the two other beasts partly through impatience of delay and partly through a desire of accomplishing their destined flight and that instead of a deeper revenge they would leave me a prey to wolves and vultures my evil destiny however prevented the execution of so excellent a design for the other ass having divined and preconceived my intention suddenly feigning lassitude fell down with all that he carried and lying as if he was dead did not endeavour to rise either by the blows of the staves or by being pricked and raised in all parts by the tail the ears and the legs till the robbers being wearied with posthumous hope and having conferred with each other in order that their flight might not be retarded by attending so long on a dead or rather stony ass they divided his burthen between me and the horse cut off his legs with a drawn sword and drawing him still breathing a little out of the public road threw him down a lofty precipice into a neighboring valley then i considering with myself the destiny of my unhappy companion determined laying aside guile and fraud to prove myself to my masters to be a worthy ass for i heard them saying to each other that we should soon stop and that then the whole of our journey would be finished in consequence of having arrived at the place of their abode at length having passed over a little hill of easy ascent we arrived at the destined place where all the bundles being untied and brought into their habitation as i was now liberated from my burden i refreshed myself by rolling in the dust instead of making use of a bath both the thing however and the occasion itself demand that i should here give a description of the places and the cavern in which the robbers dwelt for thus i shall at the same time make trial of my own genius and enable the reader to perceive clearly whether i was also an ass in understanding and sense there was a dreadful mountain shaded by the trees of a forest and lofty in the extreme the oblique windings of this in the part of which it was surrounded with the most rugged and therefore inaccessible rocks were environed with valleys full of very deep receptacles of water and everywhere thick set with thorns which afforded a native defence the streams of a fountain falling from the summit of the mountain spread themselves in large bubbles and rolling through the declivities poured forth water as bright as silver and being now divided into many rivulets and irrigating those valleys with stagnant floods they enclosed the whole like a calm sea or a sluggish river where the borders of the mountain end a lofty tower rose over the cavern fortified by a sheep cot consisting of strong hurdles well adapted for the habitation of sheep and having its sides every way extended before the door small branches expanded themselves so as to serve instead of a wall and which you might certainly on my authority denominate the courtyard of robbers nor was it scarcely anything else than a small cottage covered in a disorderly manner with reeds in which spies selected by lot from the band of robbers as i afterwards found watched by night into this place where they had with difficulty penetrated one after another with their members compressed on account of the narrowness of the entrance i and my companion being secured by a strong bridle before the door they thus spoke in anger to a certain old woman who was bent with the weight of old age and to whom alone the safety and protection of so many young men appeared to be committed 
do you who are the last relics of the grave the chief disgrace of life and the only thing loathed by hell thus idly sitting at home sport with us nor afford any solace to these our labours so great and so dangerous by at least providing for us a supper though late you who are accustomed to do nothing else by day and by night than greedily ingurgitate wine in your insatiable stomach the old woman trembling and fearful on hearing them thus speak replied but o oh young men my most puissant and faithful preservers there is an abundance of pottage for you well boiled with a pleasant flavour there is also a great quantity of bread wine plentiful poured into well purified bowls and warm water prepared according to custom for your hasty bath when she had thus spoken they immediately undressed themselves and being naked refreshed by the heat of a great fire sprinkled with water and anointed with oil they reclined before tables largely furnished with food they were however scarcely seated when behold a far greater number of other young men entered whom you would immediately suppose to be similarly thieves for they also brought with them plunder viz gold and silver coin vases and silken garments interwoven with golden threads these being refreshed by similar bathing seated themselves on the beds of their companions and some of them being selected by lot were ministrant to the rest they eat and drink in a disorderly manner and pottage and bread and bowls of wine were heaped in abundance on the tables they play clamorously they sing streperously and they jest contumelously and in everything else resemble the theban lapithae and the semi-brutal centres then one among them who surpassed the rest in strength said we indeed bravely broke open the house of milo of hypata and besides so great an abundance of wealth which we strenuously procured for ourselves through our fortitude we departed to our camps with all our band in safety and have returned home with an increase of eight feet if this is to be at all considered as contributing to our game but you who have robbed in the boeotian cities have brought back a debile number of your troop having lost your most brave leader lamachus whose life i should deservedly prefer to all the spoil which you have brought home his too great fortitude however was his destruction but the memory of so great a man will be celebrated among that of illustrious kings and the leaders of armies as to you who are frugal robbers you exercise the scrutinizing art in small and servile thefts timidly creeping through baths and the little houses of old women to this one of the latter band replied are you alone ignorant that larger houses are much more easily plundered for though large houses contain a great number of servants yet each of these is more attentive to his own safety than to the wealth of his master but men who lead a frugal and private life more sharply defend and guard their fortune if small at the hazard of their life or if ample preserve it cautiously concealed and in the last place the thing itself will verify what i have asserted for we had scarcely arrived at thebes the city of seven gates when while we diligently inquire after the wealth of each of the citizens which is the primary study of this our art a certain usurer named chrysaros who was master of a great sum of money was not concealed from us who through the fear of offices and public employments pretended with great art not to be opulent lastly this man living alone and remote from others contented with a small well-fortified cottage but beggarly in his apparel and sordid in his expenditure set brooding over his bags of gold we agreed therefore first to break into his house in order that despising the resistance of only one hand i e the hand of chrysoros we might without any difficulty quietly obtain all his wealth without delay therefore as soon as it was night we waited before his gate as it did not appear to us to be prudent either to take it off the hinges or remove it or break it open lest the noise of the folding door should raise all the neighborhood to our destruction then that magnanimous standard-bearer our lamachus through confidence in his well-tried valor gradually introducing his hand into that part of the gate which was perforated for the purpose of putting in the key endeavored to draw back the bolt but chris rose the most iniquitous of all bipeds having been for some time awake and perceiving what was transacted gradually crept to the door with a gentle step and at the same time preserving a profound silence and suddenly with the most powerful effort fastened the hand of our leader with a great nail to a plank of the door leaving him also thus fixed by a deadly bond he ascended to the roof of the cottage and from thence vociferating with a very loud voice 
beseeching his neighbors and calling them by their respective names and admonishing them to regard their common safety he exclaimed that his house was unexpectedly on fire thus every one being terrified by the proximity of the impending danger anxiously ran to procure assistance then we being placed in the ambiguous peril either of falling into the hands of those who were alarmed by the cries of chryseros or of deserting our companion devised by his consent the occasion requiring it a strenuous remedy for we cut off that part of the arm of our leader which joins the hand to the shoulder by a blow inflicted through the middle articulation and having left the arm there we bound up his wound with many rags lest the drops of blood should betray our steps and hastily took with us what remained of lamachus and while ignorant of the men in the place we are urged by the great tumult and terrified into flight by the instant danger he not being able either to follow us rapidly or to remain where he was securely the magnanimous and transcendently brave man entreating us with many words and many prayers exhorted us by the right hand of mars and by the faith of our oath to liberate him who was a good fellow-soldier both from torment and captivity for how is it possible that a bold robber can survive his right hand by which alone he is able to plunder and kill he added that he should be sufficiently happy to be willingly slain by the hand of one of his associates and when he could not persuade any one of us to commit a voluntary parricide he drew his sword with the hand that remained and having for a long time kissed it plunged it with a most powerful stroke through the middle of his breast then we venerating the vigor of our magnanimous leader diligently wrapped his mutilated dead body in a linen garment and committed it to the sea to be concealed and now our lamachus lies buried in all that element and he indeed tr terminated his life in a manner worthy of his virtues moreover alchemists could not withdraw himself from the sinister knot of fortune by his sagacious undertakings for he having broken open the cottage of an old woman while she was asleep when he had ascended into an upper bedchamber and ought immediately to have slain her by strangling her was willing first to throw to us everything out of a loftier window in order that we might take it away and when he had now strenuously thrown out all her goods and was not willing to spare even the bed of the sleeping old woman having rolled her out of it he prepared in like manner to throw out the counterpane which covered her but the most iniquitous woman falling at his knees deprecated him as follows why o oh my son i beseech you do you give the poor and lacerated furniture of a miserable old woman to my opulent neighbors to whose houses this window extends alchemist being deceived by the crafty cunning of these words and believing that what she said was true fearing lest what he had thrown out before and what he might throw out afterwards should through his mistake not fall into the hands of his associates but into other houses thrust his body out of the window in order that he might sagaciously survey every thing and particularly the contiguous houses of which the old woman had spoken while however he was attempting this strenuously indeed but without sufficient caution that most wicked old woman while yet he was inclined downwards and pendulous and perfectly astounded with the survey threw him out headlong with an impulse which though feeble was nevertheless sudden and unexpected but he falling not only from a great height but also on a prodigiously great stone which happened to lie near the house separated and burst the articulation of his ribs and vomiting rivers of blood escaped from life without being long tormented having first narrated to us what had been transacted him we also buried in a manner similar to the funeral of our former leader and gave him as a good companion to lamachus then suffering the wound of a double loss and rejecting our theban enterprise we went to the next city which is platea there we found a certain man of great fame whose name was demacares about to exhibit the spectacle of gladiators for this man being of most noble birth and excelling in wealth and liberality procured pleasures for the public with a splendor worthy of his fortune where is the man whose genius is so great or whose eloquence is so powerful as to be able to explain in appropriate words the several species of the manifold apparatus here were gladiators famous for the dexterity of their hand there hunters of well-tried celerity and in another place criminals preparing for their banquets with insane tranquillity food to fatten wild beasts there were stages consisting of beams fixed in each other towers formed from the junction of planks after the manner of a circumforaneous house in which were elegant pictures and which were the beautiful receptacles of the hunting which was to be exhibited in the circus 
and besides this who can enumerate the multitude and the different kinds of wild beasts for with the greatest diligence he had been careful to procure from abroad those noble sepulchres of condemned heads but besides the other apparatus of so beautiful a spectacle he had procured in some way or other with all the wealth of his patrimony a great number of very large bears for besides those which he had captured by hunting and besides those which he had bought for a great price he also solicitously nourished others with sumptuous care which his friends contending with each other in kindness had sent him as gifts this apparatus however of the public pleasure so illustrious and so splendid could not escape the noxious eyes of envy for these bears being unwearied with their long captivity and at the same time macerated with the burning heat of summer and being also morbid from long indolence were seized with a sudden pestilence and reduced to a very inconsiderable number hence you might everywhere see lying in the streets ferine shipwrecks of half animated bodies then the ignoble vulgar whom rude poverty compelled to seek for sordid succor to their emaciated belly and gratuitous food began to run to the meat which was scattered everywhere finding this to be the case i and this fabulous thought of the following subtle stratagem we brought to our lodging a bear which surpassed the rest in fatness of body as if we intended to prepare it for food and having perfectly stripped the skin from the flesh and carefully preserved all his nails the head of the beast being also left entire as far as to the confine of the neck we attenuate the whole hide by diligently scraping it and sprinkling it with ashes reduced to a fine powder expose it to the sun to be dried and while it is purified by the heat of that celestial fire we in the meantime being powerfully fattened with the muscular flesh of the bear made those of the troop that were present take the following oath viz that one of our number who excelled the rest not so much in strength of body as in fortitude and who especially should undertake this voluntarily should assume the form of a bear being covered with that skin and that also being brought into the house of democares he should afford to us an easy entrance through the gate in the opportune silence of the night this crafty transformation encouraged many of our most valiant associates to engage in the undertaking and thrasileon being elected by the suffrages of the band in preference to the rest adventured the peril of that doubtful machine the hide of the bear and now with a serene countenance he concealed himself in the hide which was now pliable and tractable through its softness then we sewed up the extreme parts with a fine seam and covering the opening of it though very narrow with a multitude of surrounding hairs we also put the head of thrasileon into the skin near the throat in which the neck of the beast had been cut off and having left small holes about the nostrils and eyes for the purpose of respiration we enclosed our most brave associate who was now entirely made a brute in a cage which we had bought for a small sum of money into which he hastily crept with constant vigor of mind thus the first principles of the fallacy being begun we proceeded as follows to the rest having obtained by inquiry the name of one nicanor who derived his origin from a thracian race and between whom and democares there was the greatest friendship we counterfeited a letter in which that excellent friend was made to say that he had dedicated the first fruits of his hunting to democares as an ornamental gift and now the evening being far advanced trusting to the assistance of darkness we presented to democares the cage in which Thras thrasileon was enclosed together with that forged epistle but he admiring the magnitude of the beast and being delighted with the opportune liberality of his friend ordered that ten pieces of golden coin should be immediately told out from the little coffers which he had with him to us who had brought him so acceptable a present then as novelty is accustomed to excite the minds of men to sudden spectacles many ran together to the brute admiring its size whose more curious inspection our thrasileon restrained in a sufficiently crafty manner by advancing towards them in a threatening attitude and the citizens with one according voice proclaimed democares completely happy and blessed who after so great a destruction of wild beasts had been able to resist in some way or other the attacks of ill fortune by a new supply he ordered therefore that the beast should be immediately taken to his newly fallowed land and that he should be brought back from thence when it was requisite with the greatest care to this however i subjoined 
be careful sir that you do not suffer this animal who is fatigued with the heat of the sun and the length of the way to be mingled with a crowd of many wild beasts and which i hear are not well but rather provide some place of your house for him which is open and exposed to the wind or rather which borders on some lake and is cool do you not know that animals of this kind always couch in shady groves and humid caves and on pleasant hills and near gallant fountains Demacaris, being alarmed by these admonitions and considering with himself how many white beasts he had already lost assented without hesitation to what i said and readily permitted us to put the cage wherever we pleased but i said we also are ready to watch by night in this very place before the cage in order that we may more accurately administer meat to the beast seasonably and give him his accustomed drink as he is fatigued from the inconvenience of the heat and the trouble he has suffered in being brought hither to this demacaris answered we are not in want of your labour for now nearly all my servants are from long custom f skilled in feeding bears after this having bade him farewell we departed and going out of the gate of the city we beheld a certain monument raised at a considerable distance from the public road in a solitary and secret place there we opened certain coffins which through rottenness and age were only half covered and which contained dead bodies that were now nothing but dust and ashes as the receptacles of our future spoil and having according to the rules of our art observed the time of the night in which the moon does not shine and in which sleep powerfully invades and oppresses the hearts of mortals with his first impetus we stopped with our band armed with swords before the doors themselves of Demacaris, as if we had come according to agreement to plunder his house nor did thrasileon less accurately creep out of his cage availing himself of that time of the night which is adapted to theft and immediately slew with a sword all the guards that were sleeping near him and directly after the porter himself taking the key also he opened the folding doors of the gate and to us who promptly ran and were received into the interior parts of the house he pointed out a treasury where in the evening he had cunningly seen many silver vessels deposited this being immediately broken open through the force of our compact cohort i ordered each of my associates to take as much gold and silver as he could quickly conceal it in those, those habitations of the most faithful dead and returning with speedy steps reiterate his burdens for i said that i alone would remain before the doors of the house attentively observing everything that occurred till they returned as this would contribute to our common good for it appeared to me that the form of a bear running through the middle of the house was adapted to terrify any of the servants who might happen to be awake for who however brave and intrepid he might be would not on beholding the stupendous form of so great a beast especially in the night immediately betake himself to flight and keep himself terrified and trembling in his bolted chamber end of chapter four part one Chapter Four, Part Two of the Metamorphosis or Golden Ass. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee J. Seipel. The Metamorphosis or Golden Ass by Apuleius, translated by Thomas Taylor. Chapter Four, Part Two. Sinister events, however opposed all these plans, which were prepared with salutary counsel. For while we were anxiously awaiting for the return of our companions, a certain menial boy, being disturbed, so the gods ordained, by the noise, crept gently forward, and seeing the bear running without restraint through the whole house, he observed the greatest possible silence, returned from whence he came, and told everyone, as far as he was able, what he had seen in the house, and without delay, the whole house was filled with a numerous assemblage of servants. The darkness of the night was illuminated with torches, lamps, wax and tallow candles, and other instruments of nocturnal light. Nor did any one among so great a multitude come without arms, but all of them being furnished with clubs, spears, and drawn swords, occupy and defend the entrance of the house. They also excited those hunting dogs that have long ears and rough hairs to repress the beast then i the crowd of servants still increasing left the house with a retrograde flight but concealing myself behind the gate 
I beheld Thrasilon, wonderfully resisting the dogs. For though he was arrived at the last goal of life, yet not being forgetful either of himself or of us, or his pristine fortitude, he struggled against the gaping jaws themselves of Severus. Lastly, reclaiming with spirit the scenic person which he had voluntarily assumed, at one time flying and at another resisting, with the various figures and gestures of his body, he at length escaped from the house. Yet, though he had gained his liberty abroad, he was not able to procure his safety by flight. For all the dogs of the next street, who were sufficiently fierce and sufficiently numerous, mingled themselves in the troop of those hunting dogs, which, at the same time, came out of the house and pursued him in a similar manner. I then beheld a miserable and deadly spectacle, our Thrasilon surrounded and besieged by troops of dogs, cruelly attacking and lacerating him with numerous bites. Lastly, not enduring to see him suffer such great pain, I mingled myself with the surrounding crowd of people, and thus dissuaded the instigators of the dogs, this being the only thing in which I could give secret assistance to my excellent associate. O oh, great and extreme wickedness, I said, we are destroying a large and very precious beast. My artful address, however, to the crowd was of no advantage to the most unhappy youth, for a certain tall and robust man, running out of the house, instantly thrust a spear through the middle of the viscera of the bear, and the like was also done by another person. And behold, many having shaken off fear, contended with each other in drawing near to, and piercing him with their swords. But Thrasilon, the illustrious ornament of our band, having at length that spirit of his, which was worthy of immortality, vanquished, but not his patience, did not violate the faith of his oath by any vociferation or howling, but being now lacerated by the bites of the dogs, cut in pieces by the sword, and imitating with all his might the bellowing of a wild beast, enduring also with a generous vigor his present calamity, reserved for himself glory, and rendered back his life to fate. Nevertheless, he had struck that crowd with such great terror and fear that till dawn, and even when it was broad daylight, no one dared to touch the beast, even with his finger, though he was prostrate on the ground. At length, however, a certain butcher, who was a little bolder than the rest, having slowly and timidly cut open the belly of the beast, stripped the magnificent robber of the bear's hide by which he had been concealed. Thus Thrasilon also perished for us, but has not perished so far as pertains to renown. We therefore, having immediately collected those bundles which the faithful dead had preserved for us, and quitting with rapid step the boundaries of Plataea, frequently considered with ourselves that no fidelity was to be found in life, because faith, hating our perfidy, had descended to the region of departed spirits and the dead. Thus all of us, being fatigued with the weight of our bundles and the roughness of the way through which we traveled, and also having lost three of our associates, we have brought these spoils which you see. After he had thus ended his speech, they poured out wine from golden bowls to the memory of their dead associates. And afterwards, having soothed the god Mars by certain hymns, they slept for a short time. But that old woman distributed to us fresh barley in abundance and without measure, so that my horse, indeed, having obtained such a great plenty and enjoying it alone, might think that he was received at a pontifical banquet. I, however, though at other times, well, I was a man, I had also eaten barley, gradually broken, diminished by the long continued section and boiled in broth, having explored a corner in which the remainder of the bread, belonging to the whole band, had been heaped together, strenuously exercised my jaws, which had been injured by long fasting, and now began to be covered with the webs of spiders. And behold, when the night was far advanced, the robbers, being roused from their sleep, removed their camp, and being variously equipped, so that one part of them was armed with swords, but another was transformed into nightly ghosts, they left their abode in hasty steps. Nevertheless, not even impending sleep could prevent me from eating incessantly and greedily. 
and though before, when I was Lucius, I could depart from the table, contented with one or two loaves, yet then indulging my belly, which was so capacious, I had now nearly eaten the third canister of bread. The bright light of day found me intent on this employment. At length, however, being impelled by asinine shame, but reluctantly departing from thence, I assuaged my thirst in a neighboring rivulet. Not long after this, the robbers returned, very anxious and solicitous, bringing with them no bundle whatever, nor even a mean garment, but armed alone with swords, they brought with all their hands and all their forces of the band a virgin of a beautiful form, and, as the magnificence of her habit indicated, one of the first rank of that country. The virgin was, by Hercules, an object of desire even to such an ass as I was. But she was brought in by them, lamenting and tearing her hair, together with her garment. As soon as they had entered into the cavern, they thus addressed her in words intended to mitigate her grief. As you are in perfect security, both with respect to your life and your modesty, give a truce to your sorrow for a few days for the sake of our gain, the necessity of our poverty compelling us to adopt this mode of life. But your parents, though they are very avaricious, will nevertheless, without delay, give, out of the great wealth which they have accumulated, a sum of money adequate to the redemption of their daughter. By these and similar babblings, the grief of the virgin was by no means appeased, for she wept immoderately with her head placed between her knees. They, however, called to the old woman within the cavern and ordered her to sit with the virgin and console her as much as possible with bland conversation, and then they betook themselves to their accustomed employment. But the virgin could not be recalled from her tears, which she had begun to shed, by any words which the old woman employed, but deploring more profoundly her condition and agitation which she suffered from her continual sobbing made me also weep, and she thus lamented, Is it possible that I, miserable creature, can either cease to weep or consent to live when deprived of such a house, of so many attendants, of such dear little slaves, and of such venerable parents, since I am now become the prey of unhappy rapine, and made a slave, servilely enclosed in this stony prison, and prevented from the enjoyment of all those delicacies in which I was born and nurtured, I am placed in doubt of my life, and in fear of the torments of executioners. Being thus in the power of so many and such outrageous robbers, and of a horrid band of gladiators. The virgin, having thus lamented, and being debilitated with mental grief, the tension of her throat, the fatigue of her body, she dismissed her marked eyes to sleep. She had scarcely, however, closed her eyes, when shaking off sleep, after the manner of those who are furiously agitated by the nymphs, she began to afflict herself much more grievously, and also to beat her breast with her cruel hands, and to strike her beautiful face. Profoundly sighing also, she thus replied to the old woman, who earnestly inquired what were the causes of her new and restored sorrow. Now, alas, I am utterly undone. Now I have renounced salutiferous hope. A halter or a sword, or certainly a precipice, must doubtly be embraced by me. On hearing this, the old woman became somewhat more incensed, ordered her with severe countenance to tell her the cause of her sorrow, or why, having been asleep, she thus suddenly renewed her immoderate lamentations. Do you design, she said, to defraud my young men of the great sum of money which they will obtain for your redemption? But if you persist any further in indulging this immoderate grief, despising those tears of which robbers make no account, I will cause you to be burnt alive. The virgin, being terrified by these words, kissed the hand of the old woman and said, Spare me, my parent and being mindful of human piety, afford some little aid to my most afflictive condition. For I do not think that commiseration is entirely extinguished in you, who are venerably hoary through more extended age. In the last place, therefore, survey the scene of my calamity. A beautiful youth of first rank among his fellow citizens, whom the whole city publicly elected for its son, and who, besides this, was my cousin, surpassing me by three years only in age, 
who was nourished and educated with me from infancy, and separably dwelt with me in the same house, and partook of the same bedchamber and bed, was affianced to me by mutual affection of holy love, and who some time since had been destined by nuptial vows to the marriage compact, and was registered as wedded by the consent of our parents. This youth had emoliated victims in the temples and sacred edifices, accompanied by a great multitude of relatives and neighbors. The whole house was covered with laurel, was luminous with torches, and resounded with a nuptial song. Then my unhappy mother, supporting me in her bosom, gracefully decorated me with nuptial ornaments, and frequently giving me sweet kisses, extended with anxious wishes her future hope of offspring. When on a sudden, robbers armed like gladiators, rushing in with great violence, raging as in war, and shining with drawn and threatening sword, did not bring with them the hand of slaughter or rapine, but immediately invaded our bedchamber in a condensed and conglobed band, and without any reluctance or even the smallest resistance on the part of our servants, they tore me away, miserable creature, lifeless with dire dread, from the bosom of my trembling mother. Thus our nuptials were disturbed and dissolved, like those of Pyrethus, the daughter of Anthrax. But behold, now also my misfortune is renewed, or rather is increased, by a most inauspicious dream. For I seem to myself to be violently expelled from my home, from my bedchamber, and lastly, from the bed itself, and hurried through inaccessible deserts to call on the name of my most unfortunate husband. He, however, as soon as he was deprived of my embraces, even then being perfumed with ointments and adorned with wreaths of flowers, followed my footsteps while I fled with foreign feet. And while he loudly implored the assistance of the people, lamenting the rape of his beautiful wife, one of the robbers, being moved in indignation through his importunate pursuit, slew the unhappy youth, my husband, by striking him with a great stone which he found lying before his feet. But I, being terrified by the atrocity of the spectacle, am tremblingly roused from the deadly dream. Then the old woman, receiving her lamentations with a sigh, thus began, Be of good courage, my mistress, and do not terrify yourself with the vain fictions of dreams. For not to mention that the images of diurnal sleep are said to be false, nocturnal visions sometimes signify events contrary to what they represent. Lastly, to weep, to be beat, and sometimes also to be slain in dreams, announces a lucrative or prosperous event. While on the contrary, to laugh, to fill one's belly with delicious food, or to be dissolved in venereal pleasure, predicts affliction from sorrow, bodily disease, or other evils. I, however, will recall you from your grief by pleasant narrations and old woman's fables. In a certain city lived a king and queen, who had three daughters of conspicuous beauty. Of these, the two elder, though of the most agreeable form, were not thought too lovely to be celebrated by the praises of mankind. But the beauty of the younger sister was so great and illustrious that it could neither be expressed nor sufficiently praised by the poverty of human speech. At length, a multitude of citizens an abundance of strangers whom the rumor of the exalted spectacle had collected together, full of ardent zeal, stupid with admiration of her inaccessible beauty, and moving their right hands to their mouths while their forefinger was placed on their erect thumb, venerated her with religious adorations as if she had been the goddess Venus herself. And now fame had pervaded the neighboring cities and contiguous regions, and had reported that the goddess whom the azure profundity of the deep brought forth, and the dew of the foamy billows nourished, now everywhere exhibiting her divinity, was conversant with the midst of the people, or certainly that once more from a new bosom of the celestial stars, not the sea, but the earth, had produced another Venus. Endued with virgin-like flower, thus opinion increased immensely every day, Thus extended fame wandered over the neighboring islands, a great part of the continent, and the multitude of provinces. Now many mortals, by long journey on land, or over the deep passages of the sea, came to behold the glorious specimen of the age. No one sailed to Paphos, no one to Nidus, or even to Cythera, for the spectacle of the goddess Venus. 
the sacred concerns of the goddess were abandoned her temples were deformed her ceremonies neglected her images uncrowned and her desolate altars defiled with frigid ashes while a girl was supplicated in her stead and the divinity of so great a goddess was appeased in the human countenance and the name of the absent venus was propitiated in the morning progressions victims and banquets of the virgin and now the people frequently assembling in the streets and throwing flowers intertwined with garlands or loosely scattering them prayed to her divinity this immoderate translation of celestial honors to the worship of a mortal virgin inflamed the vehement mind of true venus so that impatient with indignation and raging high in her agitated head she thus discoursed with herself behold the ancient parent of the nature of things lo the first origin of the elements behold the bountiful venus of the whole universe the honor of whose majesty is divided with a mortal girl and whose name raised to the heavens is profaned by sore terrestrials indeed by sharing in common the expiations which are offered to divinity i sustain an uncertain part of deputed veneration and a girl of noxious morality bears about my celestial image it is in vain that the shepherd paris whose justice and faith the mighty jupiter approved preferred me to such great goddesses on account of my illustrious form but she who thus rejoices whosoever sh she be shall not usurp my honors for i will cause her to repent of her illicit beauty and immediately she calls her son that winged and sufficiently rash youth who with his depraved manners contemning public discipline armed with flames and arrows running through other men's houses by night and corrupting the matrimony of all commits such mighty wickedness with impunity and effects nothing useful and good him though haughty by genuine license she stimulates by her words she brings him to the city and openly shows him psyche for this was the name of the girl and having told him the whole tale concerning the emulation of her beauty groaning and raging with indignation i beseech thee says she by the leagues of maternal love by the sweet wounds of thine arrow by the mellifluous burnings of that flame to afford thy parent full revenge through your reverence of me and severely punish that rebellious beauty above all willingly effect this one thing that the virgin may be detained by most ardent love of the lowest of mankind whom fortune has deprived of his dignity patrimony and safety and so infirm that he may not find his equal in misery throughout the world having thus spoke and for a long time and closely embraced her son with ardent kisses she sought the neighboring margin of their affluent shore and with rosy feet trod on the topmost dew of the vibrating waves behold now the water of the profound sea was appeased from its vertex and the marine train which she just began to wish appeared without delay as if she had previously commanded its attendance the daughters of nereus were present singing choruses and portunus rough with his cerulean beard and cilicia heavy with her fishy bosom small polymon the charioteer of the dolphin the company of the tritons everywhere furrowing the sea and while this softly blows his sounding shell that with a silken covering resists the unfriendly ardor of the sun another carries a mirror before the eyes of his mistress the others swim under the two yoked car such was the train which attended venus proceeding to the ocean in the meantime psyche perceived no advantage to herself from her admirable beauty she was seen by all and praised by all yet no one neither kings nor nobles nor any of the common people approached as a suitor for her possession in marriage they admired indeed her divine form but they all admired it as an image artificially polished some time prior to this her two sisters whose moderate beauty had not been celebrated by mankind having been married to suitor kings now obtained happy nuptials but the virgin psyche sitting desolate at home lamented her deserted solitude sick in her body and wounded in her soul and though pleasing to all nations she hates the beauty in herself but the most miserable father of the most unfortunate daughter suspecting the celestial hatred and fearing the wrath of the gods questioned the most ancient oracle of the milesian god 
and sought so great a divinity by prayers and victims, nuptials and a husband for the sorrowful virgin. Apollo, therefore, though a Grecian and Ionian, on account of the builders of Malaysia, gave the following article in Latin verse. On some high mountain's craggy summit place, the virgin, decked for deadly nuptial rites, nor hope a son-in-law of mortal race, but a dire mischief, viperous and fierce, who flies through ether and with fire and sword, tires and debilitates whate'er exists. Terrific to the powers that reign on high, e'en mighty Jove the wing destroyer dreads, and streams and Stygian shades abhor the pest. The king, whose days till then had been crowned with felicity, on hearing this sacred oracle, returned slowly home, oppressed with sorrow, and disclosed to his wife the mandates of the unpropitious fate. Many days were passed on this occasion in grief, weeping, and lamenting, but the cruel injunctions of the dire oracle now required to be accomplished. Now preparations were made for the deadly nuptials of the most miserable virgin. Now the nuptial was changed into a funeral torch, and the sound of the Zion, or conjugal, pipe into the querulous Lydian measure. The joyful hymnal song closed with mournful howling, and the wretched bride wiped away her tears with her own nuptial veil. The whole city likewise lamented the sad destiny of the royal house, and public mourning was immediately proclaimed on the occasion. The necessity, however, of complying with the celestial mandates importunately urged the miserable psyche to her destined punishment. The solemnities, therefore, of the mourning full marriage being accomplished with extreme sorrow, the living funeral takes place followed by all the people, and the weeping psyche attends not her nuptials, but her obsequies. However, while her sorrowful parents, who were overwhelmed with such a mighty evil, endeavored to delay the execution of the nefarious sentence, she herself exhorted them to a compliance in the following words. Why do you torture your unhappy old age with long-continued weeping? Why do you waste your spirits, which indeed are more mine than yours, with such frequent groans? Why do you deform your countenances, which in my sight are so venerable, with unavailing tears? Why do you lacerate my eyes in your own? Why do you thus tear your hoary hairs? Why thus beat your venerable breasts? These must be rewards which you are to receive of my surpassing beauty, the truth of which, having suffered a deadly blow from villainous envy, you too late perceived. Alas! Then should you have wept and lamented, then bewailed me as one lost when the people of the nation celebrated me with divine honors, and when with one voice they called me a new Venus. I now perceive, I now clearly see, that I perish through the name of Venus alone. Lead me away and place me on the rock to which I am destined by the oracle. I am in haste to accomplish these happy nuptials. I am in haste to see my noble husband. Why do I delay? Why do I avoid his approach who is born for the destruction of the whole world? The virgin, having thus spoke, was silent, and with undaunted steps mingled herself with a splendid procession of people that followed her. They advanced to the destined rock of a lofty mountain, on the summit of which, having left the royal maid alone, with the nuptial torches extinguished by their tears, they returned home, with dejected heads and desponding hearts, and her miserable parents, indeed, sinking under the weight of such a mighty calamity, shut up the gates of their palace hid themselves in darkness, and abandoned themselves to perpetual night. But the mild gales of the gently blown zephyr gradually raised Psyche, as she stood trembling and weeping on the summit of the rock. Her garments, through the tranquil breath of God, orbicularly expanding and bearing her through the hollows of the valley. At the bottom of the mountain, softly reclined her on the bosom of a flowery turf. End of chapter 4, part 2. Recording by Lee J. Seiple.